So how do we do it? How did China transform from having one of the lowest GDP per capita? Traffic jams of camels and the work of the people. They don't have a donkey or a cow. And the tools they use are more ancient than the Bible. The Chinese peasant has fought a running battle with famine. And having just survived two disasters in human history, the Great Leap Forward that killed 30 million people. With the crisis of too many people and not enough food. And the Cultural Revolution that not only wrecked the country economically, but also shattered its social fabric. <laughs> And so how China go from this place to becoming the global second largest economy, lifted more than 800 million people out of poverty, and holds the whole world's attention in terms of its wealth and power. And some people say that's because China introduced capitalism, and that is a huge part of the story. But the Soviet Union under Gorbachev also introduced capitalism, but it ended up bringing the country to a downfall. So clearly capitalism on its own is insufficient to explain China. And I know that you might be saying, well, that's because China has basic growth factors such as abundant human capital and coastal cities that are ready to export. Again, that is also a large part of the story. But India also has a large population and dominated the global trade in cotton textiles. But since the 1980s, its development has lagged. So how basic inputs are mobilized by the country is also critical. And that being said, capitalism and having basic growth factors are not a sufficient explanation to why China's transformation is so successful and unique. And that is what we are going to do in this video. And from my research, I came across three factors that came up quite repeatedly, and I'm going to give them up front. And the first one is China's intelligent leadership. China was lucky enough to have leaders who could reform the country in a way that was a drastic departure from Mao's era, under which the country's economy was strictly controlled by the government. And the second factor is that China implemented pragmatic economic policies. China was special in that it adopted a gradualist approach to its economic reform, and that was able to unleash the big potential of China's labor force, which in turn stimulated its trade economy and its domestic enterprises. And the last one is very close to my heart, and that is the Chinese culture that put a lot of emphasis on hard work and education. So let's talk about the Chinese leadership. And a very solid place to start would be in 1978, the year Deng Xiaoping took power. Quite unlike Mao, who was insistent on anti-capitalism campaigns and sentiments, which had encouraged a lot of people to make up numbers and falsify the economic results. With the only stakes they have, the Chinese people. This is one reason for the Hate America campaign that I saw all over China. Deng decided that we are going to ground ourselves in the reality. Admit that we are backward and keep an open mind and learn from other people. And most importantly, make our priority be about improving the economy and people's standards of living. And here's an example that illustrated this mindset change. By the time Deng held power, tens of thousands of young people each year were escaping to Hong Kong. When told of the problem during a visit to Guangdong in 1977, Deng explained that the solution lay not in tightening border security with more fencing and more border patrols, but in improving the economy of Guangdong so young people would not feel that they had to flee to Hong Kong to find jobs. Deng also admired success and had a particular vision for achieving it in China. 
He wanted Chinese to scour the world to learn about success, whatever the nature of the system where they took place. He wanted to know the true situation at home. He did not want to hear exaggerated reports of progress, which had caused such deep problems during the Great Leap Forward. He believed that people needed material incentives and had to see palpable progress to remain motivated. And from there, Deng successfully convinced Chinese leaders to adopt this mindset to reform Chinese economy. And I know that China's success depends on the collaborative efforts from the entire nation, but I think that this initiative that changed the turn of everything else deserved a special credit. And next, let's move on to the smart economic policies China adopted during its transformation. And at the time, there was a discussion around the type of policy that was the best for developing countries. And especially among the academic and policy communities, people believed that the root solution was to copy the developed countries and implementing policies such as free trade, privatization and removing government intervention. And this is also known as the shock therapy. And of course, China wouldn't have any of this because at the time, China still didn't completely get rid of the influence of Mao Zedong. So in a sense, China still didn't have the political environment for such a drastic approach. China worked closely with the World Bank enjoying a great deal of project-specific technical support, as well as considerable financing in the 1980s and the 1990s, but very much on its own terms. The World Bank's neoliberal prescription for financial deregulation were not entertained. So instead, China did the opposite and reformed gradually. And this mainly came in two folds. The first thing China did was to break down the economic communes under Mao's era, where everyone was working together and there was no division of responsibilities. And now, farmers were given lands that they were individually responsible for, and this massively increased the productivity and the motivation of Chinese farmers. And next, these farmers will be making money under a two-tier price system. And under this system, what a farm produced under the old quotas, which is basically what it was required to produce under the old command and control system, is priced using old prices. But anything produced in excess of the old quota is priced using free market prices. And this two-tier system increased the income of Chinese farmers, which was basically the entire population. And as their cash grew, their bank savings also grew, and these money were able to fund the manufacturing enterprises that could satisfy farmers' demand in things like fertilizers and farm equipment. And this in turn created a lot of new jobs and quasi-private enterprises that later accounted for half of the national GDP by 1985. So this was the baby of China's capitalism and how China initially generated wealth to boost its economy later. But that was just a part of the story. The second thing China did was to set up a special economic zone in Shenzhen to attract foreign direct investment, aiming to build up China's light industry. And in this special economic zones, foreign companies were granted access to the Chinese market, and in turn, they were incentivized to invest in China's infrastructure and technology. For example, from the 1990s onward, Hong Kong poured at least billions of dollars into building China's roads, ports, and residential and commercial property. And this experiment soon expanded to the rest of the country, and by 1984, China opened up its 14 coastal cities, and in 2001, China officially joined the WTOs to fully trade with the world. And the results were incredible. In the next three decades, China delivered a near 10% of growth rate and lifted more than 800 million people out of poverty. And what is really interesting about this process is that although China was and still is an authoritarian one-party state, 
In reality, at least economically, it is highly decentralized. So here the key is really regionally decentralized totalitarian system in the sense that all the local governments, all the different levels of local governments have the resources and uh, uh, control what they are going to do. So a lot of successful policies actually came from local experiments, the cooperation between government agents and private companies, and eliciting social feedback. And this is the process of how China transitioned to a mature market economy. By giving people a lot of freedom to experiment, and by doing things slowly and incrementally. It provided China with a stable and healthy environment that allowed basic growth factors to compound at an exponential rate. And lastly, let's move on to the final factor that created China's economic miracle, and that is Chinese culture. And I really want to talk about this from a more personal point of view because I experienced this so deeply in my upbringing. In Chinese culture, we believed in being ambitious, hardworking, and thrifty. And we also value good education and success. And this culture has always been there for as long as I can remember. Uh, when I was younger, the most common advice I heard from teachers and parents was definitely to study and work hard in order to have a bright future. And in schools, the subjects that we most values were always the subjects that directly contribute to business and the advancement of society. So things like math, physics, and medicine. Roughly speaking, every year China educates around 6 to 7 million university students, and 40% of which are in the STEM field. And this culture also pertains to the working world as well, especially in cities like Shanghai and Beijing and Shenzhen. People work all the time, literally all the time. And there is this 996 nine culture. People work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and for six days in a row. And in the past, I used to work for a trade company that sold Chinese goods to the rest of the world. And let me tell you, people don't ever stop working. And I was only allowed to take one day off in a month, and that was how crazy it got. But the point is, our culture is just super competitive, and that directly drives people to work harder, and I think that is going to be the norm for the years to come. Anyways, this is the condensed version of how China became so powerful with the intelligent leadership that focuses on China's economy development and improving people's life, smart economic policies that catered to China's society and reform in a gradual way, and a Chinese culture that emphasizes hard work and ambition. China was able to lift itself up from the bottom and raise to the top. Okay, I hope this video addressed this topic in a more satisfying way and you got something out of it. This is a very important video for this channel as I plan to cover more in depth on China to add to the conversation and to talk about it from a Chinese point of view. And if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate it if you could do the algorithm stuff by liking and sharing this video or any kind of interaction will do. It will help me know that viewers like you enjoy this content and also help more people better understand the complexity of China. And alternatively, if you have any thoughts on this video, please leave me a comment. It will be really fun to have a chat on that too. Uh, please consider if you don't usually do this. But either way, if you have watched to this far, I really appreciate you spending the time with me and I will see you in the next video.